Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back for some of you. So today uh, we have the pleasure of having here with us uh, uh, Victor, Victor Elvira. Uh, Victor is currently an uh, associate professor uh, in statistics and data science at the School of Mathematics in the, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, before that, he was working as, a, as an associate professor in France, in Lille, in the Institut de Mines Telecom. And uh, before that, he was an assistant professor in the, in the Universidad Carlos III of uh, Madrid in Spain. So, uh, Victor, is, uh, so his research is around uh, machine learning and statistical signal processing, computational statistics, and especially he's very focused on Monte Carlo methods for, for Bayesian inference. Uh, with applications such as sensor networks, communications, uh, ecology, biomedicine, and so on. We invited him because uh, we, Victor has been uh, working on uh, important sampling uh, methods and, and uh, we like very much uh, the research that he has been doing on, on, on this topic. And as, uh, as you know, this is a very wide and topic with a lot of applications uh, and a lot of uh, application in, in, in industry, actually. So uh, he, you will see that uh, his work is very, is very, very, very inspiring and very, very nice. So uh, one uh, about the logistics for this talk. So we, we as as in the other talks of of this series, we're gonna. So if you have any questions, when you have some question, you can write it in the in the Q and A uh, box. Um, don't use the chat. We are not reading the chat. Uh, so use the question and answer box. And then from time to time, uh, I'll read the questions to, to Victor. So we will stop, uh, in theory, we will stop after each uh, section of, of his talk. And then we will have more time uh, in the end if we, didn't, if we didn't have time to answer the questions in the, during, during the talk, okay? So without uh, further ado, uh, Victor, welcome. And uh, I give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, everyone, all the organizers of this very nice uh, series. Uh, this, um, this talk is going to be around important sampling. And this is a joint work with uh, Monica Bugayo, Emilicius Nu, Peter Juric, Josep El Alaham, uh, David Duengo, Luca Martino, Joaquin Miguez, and Christian Robert, uh, very nice uh, collaborators. I'm lucky uh, to, to work with them. And um, I'm going to start uh, with the table of contents. I will start with this uh, um, introduction, and then I will have uh, these two parts, part one, part two, part three, about multiple important sampling, active important sampling, and something related, particle filtering, uh, under this novel uh, perspective, I would say. Okay, let's go uh, block after, after block, starting uh, from the introduction. Um, I motivate this uh, important sampling with Bayesian inference. We'll see later that this is uh, important sampling is not restricted to, to Bayesian inference, but it can be uh, used in a ver very large uh, uh, number of, of applications and, and contexts. So usually you want to, in Bayesian inference, you want to know uh, some uh, hidden unknown parameters, and then you have some available data that are uh, connected through some st statistical model. And, and in the Bayesian perspective, you want to do uh, to obtain the posterior distribution of these parameters given the uh, data. Um, usually you cannot do this in, in complex interesting models, you cannot do this and you need to resort to approximations. One of the possibilities, the main, one of the main possibilities is to use uh, Monte Carlo methods. I truly recommend this uh, paper, it's not technical, it's about the history of uh, Monte Carlo methods written by Metropolis. And in Monte Carlo methods are mainly two uh, families, there are, there are more but I would like to divide it in MCMC methods where you build a Markov chain uh, with a posterior distribution uh, as, as stationary distribution. And today we are going to talk about the second family, the important sampling, which is uh, an alternative, let, let's say, to MCMC. Um, so more precisely with the notation, I will fix this notation, especially at the beginning. This is the pi tilde is going to be the posterior distribution of the unknowns given the data, which is because of the base rule, likelihood times prior divided by the normalizing constant or the marginal likelihood. I will use this notation, so pi tilde integrates up to one, pi integrates up to z, 
Um, and usually this Z is going to be unknown, as we will see right now. So for the moment, I'm going to already drop the Y notation. Y, remember, is the observations. Um, they are going to be always conditioned. They are going to be uh, part Victor? of the... Yes? Victor, uh, sorry. Uh, we, we cannot see the, the slides, actually. We only see the, the title of the slide. Uh, that's a very incon yeah. uh, inconvenient. Then, yeah. Thank you for letting me know. I guess that then I need to go to the to the other um, the other uh, application maybe. And, uh, yeah. And use yeah, maybe the, we should have point tried. Point. What about um, what about this? No. No. Yes. You you can see, for example, this. Yes. Okay, but you, you don't you cannot see the pointer, right? Yes. Yes, we see it. Okay, then it's perfect. perfect. Should I start, uh, or probably I should uh, continue here? Yes, I think it's good here, yeah. Okay, yeah, because I was uh, putting the notation, the previous yes. slide was simply um, the uh, introduction. Here we have the notation. So pi tilde is going to be the posterior distribution, which is going to be likelihood times the prior. I will try to use this notation all over the presentation. And this uh, pi is going to be the normalized version of the posterior distribution, okay? It integrates up to z. I will drop the notation I was saying, um, because I don't want to carry the data here given, but it's implicit in, in, the, in these functions with respect to x, okay? So if this is clear, um, you have worked with Bayesian inference, you know that usually you don't have this, uh, uh, this normalizing constant. You need to integrate this with respect to x. And this z is usually uh, unknown. Um, um, the goal usually is to, okay, I want to characterize this posterior distribution, and then maybe I want to compute some moments or some, some integrals with respect to it. I will say that I have this uh, as a goal, this integral, the posterior distribution integrated with respect to h, or the, the other way around, okay? Um, so important sampling. Important sampling is going to help us in this task of approximating this distribution or integrals with respect to this distribution. I put the, again the notation so it, it is clear. And important sampling is super, super easy and, and very, very uh, concise to be described because it has only two steps. One step is sampling. I want to compute, I, sorry, I want to simulate n uh, samples from the proposal distribution, some other function q. This talk is going to be a lot about this q. And then once I have these uh, uh, this, um, uh, samples, I want to assign an importance weight to each of them. So this Wn is going to be the importance weight, which is pi, remember, the normalized version, because maybe I don't have this z, divided by q. Remember, my goal is to approximate integrals of this form with respect to the posterior. If I know the normalizing constant, I can use this, the so-called unnormalized importance sampling estimator by plugging the weights here and the samples here, that's it. If I don't know the normalizing constant, I can avoid uh, using it uh, by, by uh, applying the self-normalized important sampling estimator, where I'm going to use the normalized uh, weights. So it's nothing but using the importance weights in uh, such a way, normalizing in such a way that they sum up to one, all of them, okay? So for free also, you have an estimator of the normalizing constant by simply the average of the, of the importance weights. Important sampling is everywhere. Um, I was mentioning that it's in Bayesian inference, in Bayesian machine learning. Uh, for example, this uh, kind of recent paper from, from Aki in leave one out uh, cross-validation via important sampling. In variational methods, you can approximate the gradient when you cannot compute it uh, via important sampling. You can do stochastic gradient descent by using the important sampling uh, idea in the mini batches. Uh, that's a very interesting idea. Um, in, in, in autoencoders, you can also use the importance, um, the importance sampling uh, perspective. Uh, beyond the Bayesian inference, maybe you know your targeted distribution, but you want to compute the probability of a rare event, which is the integral in some part of the space that is defined by this indicator function. Sometimes uh, it makes the integral very, very low. If you sample from the true distribution, this is not going to be very efficient. I truly recommend this paper of Artowen for doing this via multiple important sampling with applications in energy, in wireless communications, and so on. In the dynamical system, in the third part, we will see that you can use uh, important sampling in order to do Bayesian inference in state space models via sequential Monte Carlo particle filtering, which are based on important sampling. In these models, usually uh, you uh, consider that you know the model and then you want to infer the hidden state, but sometimes you don't know the model parameters, so you want to infer or estimate everything together. Very nice paper from uh, uh, Nicolas Chopin um, et al. Um, 
about doing this, this joint <coughs> estimates, uh, estimation, sorry. In reinforcement learning, something that seems a bit uh, far maybe from, from estimation, you can use important sampling or the important sampling idea. And actually in this uh, seminal paper, they have this sentence, the important sampling is an essential component of, of policy model free reinforcement learning algorithms for optimization, stochastic optimization, and so on and so on. So important sampling is everywhere. Hopefully I, I convinced you. I, I just wanted to put these two uh, slides in order to motivate, then we will go to the methodology without, for, or without an application in mind, let's say. Also, in my, and this is my opinion, and sorry for this, I used this, um, probably this title as the title of the talk, you know, a bit of a clickbait. In my opinion, important sampling can, is also a way of thinking, a way of reasoning. And I had these uh, three examples. They are not um, truly connected to any equation right now, but for example, in pass passive estimation, I call it passive because and maybe you have access to uh, asking some colleagues of you, only the people you have around, and then you want to estimate the uh, results of some elections, um, but you cannot uh, uh, count only on their opinion, you should extrapolate somehow. And the way you do it usually is that you should give more weight to those people who um, in your group, are in your group, but uh, somehow they are more representative of the part of the population that you are not seeing, uh, you are weighting differently. In active estimation, in the sense that you can maybe uh, select better where you are going to sample from, or even optimization, maybe you want to estimate the expected cost of a global health crisis, and you need to take into account probabilities uh, of different scenarios and the cost related to these uh, scenarios. And uh, usually you want to explore better or to estimate better um, uh, scenarios where either the probability or the cost is very high, and usually jointly, so the product probability times cost is high. And in general, and maybe related to the first example, every time you have a problem uh, with a combination of estimators or experts, and you're going to do a weighted combination, you're implicitly doing uh, important sampling in the way of you reason. Probably you're going to give more weight to the experts that are good fit for your problem, but also you're going to give a, a high weight, in my opinion, uh, to those experts that are underrepresented in your, in your pool of experts, they are, they are, that are re less redundant. This is very connected to important sampling, okay? Let's go to something less, uh, let's say, uh, subjective. And I go back to the, to the questions. Uh, I was saying that uh, where you uh, are going to simulate from the proposal is key in important sampling. I put you here the variance of the anormalized important sampling estimator is this guy here. And it can be shown very easily that the optimal proposal is this one. It's something which is proportional to the targeted distribution. You want to allocate mass where the targeted distribution has probability mass and also uh, uh, proportional to the absolute value of the function that intervenes here in the integral. Sometimes you only want to approximate the, the posterior distribution because you, you, you don't have any h in mind or maybe you, you have several. So usually you want to put mass, q needs to have mass where pi tilde has probability mass. Three examples. In all of them, we have this target distribution. This is always the case. This is my proposal. So I'm going to sample these, uh, these points here or, or crosses that you maybe cannot see in red are the samples. You have more around here. The, um, the vertical lines are the importance weights, are proportional to the importance weight. So for example, here you are under, uh, under covering the uh, target distribution. So when you do pi divided by q, the importance weight is going to be b. In this other scenario, now in the middle, I have uh, my proposal, which is centered more in the left. Maybe you don't realize because it's a different scale with respect to this, but it's more here. So I'm totally neglecting this second mold here. What happens is that when I sample here in the tail, and it happens when I keep sampling and sampling, this um, sample is going to take a huge weight, and those also too. Uh, what is the problem? The problem is that now I have a large mismatch between uh, these weights, for example, and those weights. This large variability in weights is equivalent to large variance of the estimators. And here I, I present a, 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 an example where the target is equal to the proposal, the proposal equal to the target, and then the importance weights, pi divided by q, are constant, are the same. So this is uh, what it looks like when you have a target divided by proposal, which is the same which is like directly sampling from a Monte Carlo estimator. This is a very interesting because like this, you recover the standard 
um, estimators where you simply uh, simulate from pi tilde. So it's very difficult to, to, to find this Q a priori. Uh, you, usually you can only evaluate this pi tilde even up to a normalizing constant, so only the normalized version. This uh, posterior can be multimodal, as Q heavy tail can have many, many problems. Maybe a posterior, you, have, you can have some uh, diagnostics in order to say, uh, okay, I'm doing a good or bad job. This is the standard approximation of the FFP sample size. It's just an approximation. It presents some serious uh, problems, I would say. You can see more details there. Um, and finally, I would say that there are two main uh, approaches to, um, to select the proposals. One is using more than one proposal, multiple important sampling. The other one is exploring the space iteratively, which is called adaptive importance sampling. These multiple importance sampling and adaptive importance sampling constitute the, the part one and two of this, of this talk. So multiple importance sampling. I have two um, proposals, for example, in this, in this case, this is just a pictorial representation. So this is my proposal one and proposal two, okay? And then this is my target distribution. In general, I'm going to have N. And for simplicity, I ask you to think this way. I want to simulate n samples, and I have a set of n proposals, n samples from n proposals. How can you do it? Um, and then what, what important weight you are going to assign? Probably many of you have some experience or even some intuition how you would do it. What I can say is that there are many, many uh, algorithms in the literature that do this, and, but they do it in a different way. Okay, let's uh, review three three uh, different examples. Example one, I have n proposals, I need, uh, I need uh, n samples. So what I do is that my first sample is simulated from the first proposal, the second from the second and so on. And then the importance weight, well, if my first sample, for example, was simulated from Q1, then it, it will carry in the denominator uh, Q1 and so on, okay? This maybe seems the most logical or straightforward extension and I have bad news for you. This is a very uh, bad choice and th th this is a very bad idea. We will, we will see it later. A second approach is, okay, I have N proposals. I don't know which one is better. So actually what I could think I have, I have this mixture equally weighted, no one is better, I don't know, of the, my uh, whole set of proposals, okay? So this C that I'm going to use from now on, please remember, this C is the mixture and weighted mixture of the proposals. And now what I do is simply IID sampling from the mixture and in the denominator, since I've used this, the mixture, then uh, I will place it there. Maybe you do this, but uh, it can happen that you will use more some proposals than others that might even not be used. And this third example is going to do the sampling exactly as in the first case, but it's going to apply the weight uh, as in the second case. So for example, the first sample is going to be simulated from Q1, but the, the first weight is going to be uh, pi divided by the whole mixture. This is kind of a, a lie, philosophical lie in important sampling, because you know that this is not the proposal from the first uh, sample. However, this works, uh, estimators are consistent and efficient, and this is actually a good idea. We'll see it later. So there are many questions. Why all these possibilities are valid? There are some that are better than others. Are many, maybe others that are possible, other ways of sampling and weighting. So we propose this uh, uh, theoretical framework for doing multiple important sampling that we call generalized multiple important sampling. Okay, the, the next three slides might be a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, hard. Um, but then we will reconnect. Okay, so I, I will, I will, I want to, to summarize this paper in three slides. So that was maybe a challenge. Please uh, try to stay with me. Um, three slides, one slide for sampling, one uh, for weighting, and one for a combination of sampling and weighting. First slide, sampling. If, if I have N proposals and I want N samples, the way I do it is that for each sample, first I select the index of the proposal that I will use, and then I, condition here on this index and then I simulate, okay? I do this for the n samples. So for a second, forget about the specific uh, distribution of a sample. Um, think as a whole. And as a whole, I mean that at the end of the day, you're going to have n samples. I want you to put them in a bag. And then from this bag of the n samples, just pick one randomly with equal probability. What we call in generalized multiple important sampling a proper uh, mis uh, sampling procedure is the one that when you take this randomly picked sample is distributed as the mixture of the whole, all the proposals, okay? 
examples that that uh, uh, fulfill this condition are just simply in front by the uh, sorry sampling uh, from the mixture. This is going to be actually fulfilling this condition, which is uh, stated more rigorously here in C1. Also, if you have the, the N indexes and you take uh, without replacement um, these indexes and you do this N times, at the end you're going to have a permutation on this of this set. These indexes are going to be a permutation of this set. This will fulfill. And also if you say, okay, I want to use the first sample, uh, for, for the first sample I want to use the first proposal for the second, the, the second and so on, this is also going to fulfill this condition. Okay, second slide. We are almost there. Waiting. What waiting functions can I use in order to make uh, some multiple important sampling scheme proper? I can use many. We realize already that th this is not unique. Okay, I ask you as, again the same exercise. Forget about the weights of each individual sample. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are going to build estimators or particle approximations. All the samples and weights are going to be interacting in some sense, okay? So I don't care about the weight of a specific sample. What I want is that when I plug the N weights here with my N samples here, this estimator is unbiased and consistent, okay? This is very generic because I, I ask you to plug any function here. There are, there are infinite number of possible functions. Okay, let's maybe impose some structure. Since in standard important sampling, we have target divided by proposal. Let's use something similar, target divided by some function. This is still generic, and still we managed to find five possible functions that I could plug here and make this condition be fulfilled. And these uh, possibilities are not exactly functions, but are, they are distributions, distributions of the samples that depends in the way you did the sampling. Those, remember, those are the indexes of the sampling procedure. Those are distribution of the samples. These two are distributions of this random variable that I created before, the randomly picked uh, sample from the set of N samples, okay? This one is, for example, the, the, the distribution of this randomly picked from condition one, you remember that this must be the C, the mixture of all, all proposals. Okay, we are arriving to the end almost. Third slide, um, combination of sampling and weighting schemes, multiple important sampling schemes. This seems not very friendly, but it's not that complicated. Stay with me, I will, I will help to, um, to navigate through it. Um, I told you that there are many ways to do sampling and weighting. I gave you three possible examples of doing the sampling and five possible functions uh, for doing the weighting. So this is nothing but combinations between sampling and weighting. You choose the sampling you want, the weighting you want, and then you have a combination. These, uh, these uh, codes here in color are unique schemes. So actually there are 15 possibilities, but only six are unique. Forget about this ugly um, um, table and let's go here. Here I'm summarizing these six unique schemes. R1, R2, R3, and one and two and three. You, for each one, you have the way to do uh, the sampling. You apply to each sample N this uh, weight, for example, and then you recover some multiple important sampling scheme that is valid. Some of them are novel, some of them we are recovering existing methods in the literature in this unified uh, framework. In the next slide, I'm going to summarize these three schemes. Okay, maybe we go to something more concrete. Imagine that you have three proposals, one, two, and three. And then you do the sampling with replacement. Remember, from the mixture, meaning that you can use one component more and, and some others will not appear. In this case, the third component appears twice, the first component once, and the second component does not appear. So I select this proposal here, meaning that X1 is going to be distributed as Q3, simulated from Q3. This is from Q3, the third one from Q2. And what I say here is that you can either choose this importance weight to each of the samples and build the estimator with these three weighted samples, and this is going to be a valid estimator. But you could also plug this uh, with a mixture here, this mixture here, which contains this, this, and this, and it's valid. Or you can also plug the mixture of all proposals, original ones, one, two, three, construct the estimators, and this is valid, okay? The second uh, uh, part of, of, of possible estimators. Uh, I will only uh, focus maybe on N1 and N3, forget about this N2. Th those are going to be, um, interesting because we are going to discuss later. So please stay with me and remember what N1 and N3 
is. In this case, uh, there is no replacement. So I will use exactly once each of the proposals. So first sample from the first proposal, second from the second, third from the third. N1 uses, the, let's say, the logical, uh, the logical um, weighting scheme using exactly the same proposal that you used. And N3 is going to use always the, the mixture in the denominator, regardless where you simulate it, okay? N1 and N3. Um, one could ask now, um, okay, you have many possibilities, but which one is better than, than other? We have many theoretical results here. I'm going to summarize only one here. And we were lucky to find this, uh, this quite generic uh, result that says, but for any target distribution, pi tilde from, uh, for any integrable function H, and regardless which set of proposal densities you are using, um, this hierarchy in the variance uh, always holds. And actually this equality only uh, is equality, this inequality is only equality when uh, all the proposals are identical. So N3 is the best. So I'm going back, this is always the best you can do among the um, uh, schemes that are uh, derived and, and analyzed here, okay? And N1, uh, unfortunately, is the, is the worst we have found so far. One numerical example um, in order to illustrate this. Um, N1 and N3, I'm going to show you the two possibilities, N1 and N3. Now I have only two proposals. I will simulate half of the samples from the first proposal and half of the samples from the second proposal. So instead of only two samples, now imagine that I'm taking a thousand from here and a thousand from there. In the N1, remember, in the N1, I follow the standard important sampling principles. If this set of samples have this Q1 as proposal, then I will apply the Q1 in the denominator. And the, the second half of samples will have uh, Q2 in the denominator. While in the N3 strategy, I will have the mixture in all of them, okay? What I'm showing you here is again, this uh, particle approximation, where this is the target, the solid one, and I have my two proposals. And probably you are wondering why I have these important weights that are huge here. And the reason is the following. Imagine that I'm sampling from this Q1, the blue one, and I sample in the tail. What happens in the tail is that the second mode here is starting. So when I do pi divided by Q, Q is very small, pi is, uh, is, uh, is large or, or medium uh, value. And then the important weight is huge. This doesn't happen here. Why not? Because Q2 is in the denominator. So even if Q1 here is going to take a very small value when I uh, particularize it here, when I um, um, plug this value X1, here this X2 uh, evaluated is going to have a, a decent value which uh, somehow attenuates the weight. This particle approximation is way better than this particle approximation. Actually, this is more a qualitative uh, pictorial representation, but if you go to the variance of the estimators, uh, in this particular example, when you do the variance of the, say, the, the, the normalizing constant uh, estimator, the variance is this number here for the N1, and for N3 is going to be this number. So you are obtaining uh, six orders of magnitude less. So if you need to remember something from this talk, I would say that every time you are simulating from different proposals in space or time, we'll see it later, please try to use all the proposals in the denominator. Is the difference between important sampling work, not working or working? It's it makes a huge difference. I don't have a, a much time for this slide. Just very, very short takeaway message. I didn't tell you all of these methods have the same number of target evaluations, one per sample, but this N3 requires way more uh, proposal evaluations in the denominator. You can see it visually very, very easily. So we, we've been working in methods that generalized this concept of plugging a mixture in the denominator and uh, you can play in something in between N1, which obtains a big error with a few proposal evaluations, and N3 that is, obtains a very small error with a lot of proposal evaluations. There, is, there are ways to obtain most of the advantages of N3 without um, um, compromising the complexity of the, of the algorithm. So I'm done with the first part. I don't know, Albert, if you want to, uh, to ask some questions uh, at this mm. point. Yes, there are a couple of questions, three, four questions. So okay. the, the first one, no, yeah, four. First one is, uh, is it fair to say that important sampling can be used as a Bayesian version of ensemble method to combine multiple models? If so, can you speak about the way to go about it? 
Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can talk very precisely about this, but I, I would say that this is very related to the third example I was putting in the way of uh, reasoning, the, the, the way of, of, of thinking about uh, uh, um, a combination of, of experts. Surely you can, you can uh, um, you, when, especially when you have comp computational complexity that you need to allocate uh, around different models or methods, you, can, you don't necessarily uh, need to use the same weight um, that you use for the resource allocation in the way you combine the estimators. And this is, this is the tricky part, but uh, for, uh, this would require a very long uh, discussion. The short answer is, is yes, yeah. So a second one, um, generalized multiple important sampling appear to be similar to a Dirichlet mixture prior as seen from the stick breaking formulation. Is that correct or am I missing something? I'm not that familiar with this stick breaking um, um, procedure. I think it's uh, for a sampling from, from Dirichlet uh, distributions. When you do this, uh, certainly you get, uh, if I, from what I remember, you have weights that are of different, uh, of different uh, um, magnitudes. I wonder if you could use this as an extra layer in order to do, in order to do multiple important sampling where the proposals have a different, a different weight. But maybe I'm missing the, 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 the point of the, of the question. We can discuss later maybe more in detail or the, the person can contact me. I, I cannot see who is asking this, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Rodney Sparapani. Well, um, so third one, in your generalized multiple important sampling schemes, you are sampling from some general proposal distribution Q, and then your weight is a function of that Q in the denominator. Mm -hmm. Does the approach still work if we only know Q up to proportionality? For instance, if Q was some posterior distribution, which we can sample from, but only know the PDF up to proportionality? Oh, that was a very good question. All of them were, were very good. Um, I would say that it, it may be tricky. In, in the way that this generalized multiple important sampling um, framework is, is built, all the proposals have the, the same weight in the mixture. I believe that uh, that if you don't know the normalizing constant, you might have problems in order to, for example, apply the, the deterministic mixture um, or this N3, which is called, sorry for this, this is called sometimes deterministic mixture or valence heuristic, just in case you see in the literature. I think you might have problems because when you evaluate here, all of them might have different normalizing constants. So I guess something else should be done uh, in order to estimate implicitly this, this or explicitly this normalizing constant. Otherwise, I don't see a straightforward way to do it, but it's something to, to look into in detail again. It's a, probably something, some research line, interesting one. Okay, and then a the last one for this section. Could Pareto's most important sampling by uh, Aki Betari uh, at all uh, help for inference in multiple important sampling? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really like this, um, this part, part of smooth important sampling uh, to the point uh, that, that I know. I've, I've uh, read it uh, um, a couple of times. Yes, the, 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 those methods that uh, try to, um, to uh, deal with heavy tail distributions in the distribution of the, the importance weights are, are very important. I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about some of them in the second part. There are other clipping strategies simpler uh, than the Pareto smooth of uh, Aki, uh, Gelman, and et al. that, uh, that are very effective. Uh, but certainly, certainly uh, this, this can be used and has been used. We, we, we've been using a similar method. There, there is one from Ionides in 2008 and another one from uh, Migas in 2015 that use similar concepts as the Pareto, Pareto smooth. I don't know, I think it, it depends more in the, in the theory and fitting the detail of this distribution. Yeah, no, very interesting as well, yeah. No more, well, we just have a new question, but we'll leave it for, for later. So you okay, can... yeah. Yeah, because uh, I was supposed to talk more, <laughs> much more, and uh, let's see uh, if, uh, if we have time. I, well, it's, for me, it's unbounded, but maybe uh, those people have something to do later.
um, let's go to the second part of the of the presentation, adaptive important sampling. Um, remember, this is the second strategy. It's not either this or, or the other one. Actually, here we are going to use multiple important sampling. We have several proposals, and, and we are going to adapt them over J iterations. So we have these proposals, and one, two, capital J are the indexes or the, of the iterations, okay? So actually, if you are using a parametric uh, proposal or set of proposals, Basically, the goal is how we are going to adapt these parameters theta that are parameterizing. For example, this is Gaussian, this is going to be the mean and the covariance of the Gaussians, okay? Um, this is called adaptive importance sampling. There are so many adaptive importance sampling methods. Uh, we, we, uh, we made an, a humble attempt here to, to gather many of the relevant ones, it's, uh, but probably we didn't cover even a tenth, uh, a tenth percent of, of, of the existing ones. And here you can find some structure, um, some classification, and some uh, CLT uh, results, and, and, and so on. I, I encourage you that if you have any interest in adaptive importance sampling, to take a look here. Actually, here I'm going to um, I'm going to reproduce the these categories that we have uh, here in order to to try to give you some hints of the different possibilities in adaptive importance sampling. Before that, just uh, a pictorial representation. Sometimes. Uh, something graphic helps. You have a target distribution, which is by model. You start with this proposal distribution, which is unimodal. And then you realize that you are not covering the proposal, uh, sorry, the target distribution well. In the second iteration here, uh, you move uh, and then you expand a bit, you uh, widen your proposal, and then you keep improving. And finally, okay, it's not perfect, but at least you are covering most of the relevant part of the uh, posterior distribution, okay? This is the idea. Generic uh, importance sampling algorithm. Just a disclaimer, not 100% of the algorithms are going to fit here, but I would say that the large portion of them are going to follow this exact structure. First step, sampling. You have N proposals. You want to simulate K samples per proposal, but you do this. You are going to obtain your NK samples by doing this, okay? exactly k samples per proposal. Then as an important sampling, you will do the weighting. Pi, a normalized version of the target, divided by some function from the previous part. Now, hopefully I convince you that is not that straightforward what you should put in the denominator, okay? And third part, the adaptation. You take the parameters here and you choose the new parameters for the next uh, iteration. Okay, at the end you have this uh, set of weighted samples. So two questions. One question, we already addressed it. Just one thing, now think of the proposals uh, as uh, spatial proposals, but also temporal proposals in the sense that now you have more possibilities than before because you can use actually uh, proposals that you use in previous iterations here in the, in the denominator and things can work, okay? We'll see maybe some examples later. Um, and the second one is how you do the adaptation. As I said in this paper, um, in this survey, we, we try to classify the methods in these three categories. I will go very, very fast, just giving some hints of some algorithms that follow this strategy. This strategy is the one that follows kind of a Markovian um, procedure or structure in the update of the uh, parameters of the proposals. So the at iteration J plus one, the parameters depend on the previous uh, parameters, but not on the samples. And once you get uh, the uh, parameters, then you um, you uh, simulate the samples, but the samples do not interact with the parameters as we will see later, okay? Those examples are, are uh, some, some uh, those algorithms are examples of this category. In this other category, the samples actually interact with the updates. Uh, this is an, an example of this very nice algorithm. Amis, maybe many of you I uh, know it. Um, this uh, algorithm is going to use the past samples in order to do moment matching. As simple as imagine that um, you have a Gaussian proposal, only one, and then you are going to um, to update its mean and its covariance just by doing the, the uh, sample mean and sa sample covariance from the past. And then by doing this, uh, you are going to let's say have a proposal that is going to be closer and close, closer to the, to the target distribution. And finally, a third uh, category that is slightly related but not the same is by doing um, resampling steps from the previous set of samples. So here, the update is only at J plus one, depends only on the samples of iteration J. This is the so-called family of population Monte Carlo algorithms. 
And I'm going to go into the detail uh, of uh, one uh, that we proposed uh, recently. So the same structure that before, sampling, waiting, and adaptation of the proposal, sampling exactly the same. So think for the sake of the example that we have N Gaussian um, distributions and the covariance is going to be fixed. We are going only to uh, update the, the mean, the, the location parameter, the mean in the, in the Gaussian. We will sample K from a K sample from each uh, uh, Gaussian uh, proposal. Then in the weighting, we are going to, for each of the N K samples, we will do pi target divided by the mixture of all proposals at iteration J. So the, which, which is called the spatial mixture. Uh, AMIS, for example, use a, a temporal mixture, use the, the previous from previous time steps. Here we are going to use the N of iteration J, okay? And for the adaptation, we will do a resampling step. Uh, many of you probably know uh, about our resampling step, otherwise I will say it very, very fast. Um, you have this set of NK samples. You have the importance weights. You can normalize them in such a way that the NK weights sum up to one, and then you will pick from this set of samples with replacement and items with probability equal to the normalized weights. Uh, in this case, should be normalized weights, okay? And if you do this, maybe you're going to have some uh, replicas here. You will use these uh, resampled particles as location parameters for the next time step. By doing so, basically what you are doing is that if you sample in a place of the space that has a, a big importance weight, one or several proposals can move to this area. You discover uh, probability mass and then you will place more proposals there, okay? I'm going to show you this uh, deterministic mixture population Monte Carlo, the algorithm that I just presented um, in the right side. And in the left side, I'm going to modify it a bit. I'm going to remove, remember from here that I'm using this deterministic mixture, the N3 scheme we saw before weights. And in the left side, I'm going to use the same algorithm by but using the N1, remember the one that I only use the proposal that I use in order to simulate it is the one that I will plug in the denominator, okay? Let me explain you this example, maybe you infer it already. I have a two uh, dimensional um, and, and, and also two modes uh, target uh, by model, sorry, uh, target distribution. Um, this mode is 80% of the mass. This mode is 20% of the mass. What you see here, it's an, I'm overkilling basically, so you can see the effect. I have 500 proposals, 500 proposals. And then we will see, this is the location parameters of these Gaussian proposals, and we will see how they evolve, okay? Here you can see the marginals uh, of the target distribution and also the, of uh, what I should call this C. This is the mixture uh, of all proposals, okay? This is going to, what I would like is that I approximate with the red curve, the, the blue curve. This is iteration j equal one. I'm moving to j equal two. What I do is the previous algorithm, I sample, I obtain the weights and then I do the resampling. And okay, in, in both scenarios, in both algorithms, I, I go to both modes. Okay, for the moment, it's okay. Here I'm showing you this n1 is the proportion of proposals that are close to the mode one. And this is the proportion of the proposals that are close to the mode two. Here I'm doing the same, okay? Iteration two, iteration three, in iteration three, by luck, I have 80% of the proposals here, 20% here. In the not as good uh, ways, the N1 ways uh, version of the algorithm, I have most of proposals here. If I continue J equal one, uh, four, J equal five, I lost this mode. I lost this mode, while here I keep having more or less 80% uh, percent of the proposals here, 20% of the proposals here. Here, basically, I'm missing this mode. I'm missing. I think this is dramatic. It's dramatic because it's, especially in high dimensions, it's very complicated to find zones of probability mass. But it's even more dramatic to, to, to lose them once you had found them in the past, okay? What is the reason? The reason is that these importance weights are good not only for the estimators, as we showed before, but also for the resampling step. Why? Because when I do a resampling step, what I'm doing is that I'm going to replicate proportional to this probability. When I normalize it, it's a, it's a probability. And if you see this probability as the following, maybe it will make more sense. This importance rate is going to measure the mismatch between the target distribution and the whole set of proposals. What I'm using in order to, to, to uh, simulate my new set of samples. So for a given point, I'm going to compute 
how uh, overrepresented or underrepresented the target is with respect to my full set of proposals. So basically, if I'm over uh, over uh, over representing uh, overpopulating this mode here, I will realize and I will put more uh, uh, proposals here. If you think in this way, at least in my opinion, this is useful. When you see these weights, these weights do not interact. Each proposal samples and then puts its weights independently where the other proposals are. So that, that's why all the proposals at the end of the day, they will try to go to the, to the highest peak, to the, to the best mode, because they are not cooperating. They are not telling each other, hey, I, I'm already here. Maybe you might want to explore or to cover other, not as important, but the still important parts of the space. So this is a second explanation why this N3 of deterministic mixture or balanced heuristic weights should be a preferred anytime you have a, uh, the possibility, okay? Single, uh, um, uh, end of the second uh, part, uh, maybe I advert if someone wants to ask questions, it's a good yes. moment. Yes, we have some. Um, so the first one, um, is there, I think it's more related to the first one, actually to the, to the other section, is there a possibility there exists a different weighting function to N3 that yields even lower variance, perhaps for specific classes of models? Hmm. Yes, and the answer is yes, and the answer is the following. For every single integral, integral. so when you're targeting, targeting a specific integral, there is, if I'm not mistaken, that there is some exception, but in general, there is a proposal, which could be a mixture, that gives you zero variance with only one sample. Okay, this is what is called the optimal proportion, uh, proposal for the unnormalized important sampling estimator. So certainly it is, certainly it is. Um, but this, uh, once said this, I would say that uh, this optimal proposal is very tough to find in general, and we should go example after example. What is difficult, in my opinion, is to find um, an estimator as this N3 that, if you remember the theorem, for any target distribution, targeted distribution, for any function, and regardless which set of proposals you have, where you put them, how they are, the family they are, this is going to outperform always all the rest of uh, estimators. This is quite challenging. I still think it's possible. So, and actually I encourage, uh, encourage if someone wants to uh, pursue this, uh, I, I think it's possible, but I cannot tell you why, because I, uh, which one, because I don't know it. Two more questions. How the various form of important sampling scale up with the dimensionality of the problem? How does their scalability compare with methods that use derivatives, for instance, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Very good question. Um, important sampling scales uh, bad, as, uh, as most of methods, in my opinion. And I would, we could discuss also a long time about uh, the comparison, for example, between MCMC and important sampling. It is not that clear that one is going to outperform uh, the other. Um, in, in a setup, I can I can quote Nicolas Chopin uh, from two weeks ago. I was watching some discussion in the in the Royal Society of Statistics in in, a, in internet, and he has a slide. I took a screenshot, Nicolas, so you cannot uh, deny this. That said, that basically, when you have uh, less than fifty uh, dimensions, the important sampling beats everything else. Um, Maybe, I don't know if he's muted, but maybe it's better like this. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Maybe we can Let's have go a, back to this later. <laughs> we can have this, uh, this um, discussion later, yeah. Now, I would uh, appreciate more that you can deepen into, into this. Just about the Hamiltonian. Um, I think one should not um, uh, think of, um, that this is my personal opinion, between uh, Hamiltonian versus important sampling or even variational inference versus Monte Carlo and so on. I, I, I tell you one example here in, the, in, the, in this family of algorithms, for example, this, this algorithm, we are using Langevin and dynamics in order to improve the proposals in an adaptive important sampling algorithm. Um, I know that there are some attempts of doing a, a combining Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo with important sampling, and this is possible as well. So I think one should wonder if Hamiltonian Monte Carlo should work 
uh, better by its own or if it could be improved if you use this in order to then use important sampling within uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? I'm not sure if this uh, answers the question. I think it opens a debate that I find particularly interesting. Okay, so next one. Uh, yeah, there is one comment by uh, uh, Antonita Mira. So she says, uh, I see the stat uh, side paper you compare with um, with this, with this, you compare with these papers, with, with this paper, but no, but then, but then I think Antonita, you sh you you posted the paper of Victor actually. I think it's a it's a she just mistyped the 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 question. She's asking. Then she says, well, but I see no comparison with this other paper, uh, which is called adaptive in incremental mixture uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, but then she says, but you're now starting the adaptive part of your presentation, so it might come next. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I know this, this paper, maybe, maybe I saw it. I would appreciate, uh, Antonietta, if you can send it to me and, and, and discuss it. it it's, a, it's a paper that, uh, that combines MCMC with important sampling, or maybe, uh, maybe she, she cannot uh, talk right now. Uh, yeah. or we, we, can, uh, we can have this, uh, this discussion later. By the, by the way, uh, yes. yep. She says yes. Yeah, maybe yeah. Maybe we'll come okay. later with her. yeah. Yeah. Okay. We we have this combination of uh, MCMC and important sampling in this uh, layered adaptive important sampling, and we discovered uh, recently that some people after uh, rediscovered similar algorithms and probably before. Let's be honest. Sometimes uh, we might have uh, missed some some uh, some reference or some related, not exactly the same reference and I would be very, very glad. Uh, th there is an actually in, in the next MC, uh, I don't want to diverge, but in the next uh, MC QMC conference, there's going to be a session in combination between MCMC and important sampling. Um, so I, I think it's very, it's very interesting to, to, to continue uh, this, this discussion. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. I will, uh, I will email to you. Thanks. Okay, yeah. And I wanted to say also that uh, Antonietta is one of the authors of these very nice AMIs that I was commenting before. Yeah. Thank you. So I take the opportunity to to say it here. Anyways, um, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for the for the questions and for the for the references. Yep. Perfect. So our next one, um, yeah, very interesting answer. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, how well? Yeah, that that's one that I that I also wanted to ask you. Uh, another tricky one: How well does multi, multiple important sampling escape to high dimensional posterior spaces? Maybe Nicola can comment on this. No, it, it's a, oh, I'm, I'm joking. I'm not sure if 50 dimension is the, is the good, uh, is the good uh, um, threshold or not. I would, I would like to defend important sampling. Probably that's why I'm here, but I'm not a fundamentalist. I've, I've been working in, in MCMC. I really like MCMC as well from, for, for other reasons. I think important sampling has very nice properties and, and then it converges uh, uh, or, or you have, MCMC converges in, in, in a different way, but you, you, you have some guarantees in important sampling, especially for small and medium dimensions that, uh, that I think are, are difficult to, to beat. So I think we should, again, this is my personal opinion, we should distinguish between um, actual convergence when you have uh, 50 dimensions, 70 dimensions, or when we have a, a, an MCMC method, for example, or a variational uh, method in hundreds of thousands of dimensions or millions of dimensions, and we claim this is converging, I think we should be uh, we should be careful about this. Uh, but this is my this is a personal comment. I, I insist I work on all these methods, and uh, they all have pros and cons. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's all for now. Okay, maybe I can go to the third part. Um, so the third part maybe is going to be slightly different and slightly, uh, I'm not sure if more technical. I find it interesting, sorry for going back, because I, I bet that many of you are familiar with particle filtering and state space models, sequential Monte Carlo. And I'm going to present this um, in, a, in a way that resonates with multiple important sampling and adaptive important sampling, under this perspective, actually. Um, 
usually this is explained in a different in, uh, in a in a different way. So hopefully it makes sense uh, for you. And I apologize in advance if I'm going to go slightly fast. I don't want to kidnap you for uh, for a long time here. Uh, if you have, if you want more details, please go to this uh, reference here, and then you will you will have more details. But let me let me try to to give you some some hints. So the setup. Um, you know state space models, these Markovian uh, state space models, when you have a, um, an evolving state, x t minus one, this is the unknown, and this evolves over the time in a Markovian manner through this states, uh, state model with this uh, blue equation here. And then you have the observation model, the likelihood that relates, relates observations uh, with the hidden state. T, now it's, it's a temporal index, okay? So usually you keep receiving observations, the state keeps evolving over time, and then you might uh, wonder about many different uh, statistical problems. I'm not going to go into many details, but one standard problem that is of interest is the, um, to obtain this uh, distribution, the filtering distribution, distribution of the hidden state at time t, given all the observations from one up to t. This contains one, two, three, up to t, observ uh, the observations, okay? Um, you might wonder, as, as I said, about other, other problems, but uh, they are very closely related. Unfortunately, um, if you want to obtain this distribution, this is possible in very few cases, okay? Maybe in hidden Markov models when this is a, a discrete space or when you have a continuous space, but you have a linear dependency here, linear dependency here, and additive and Gaussian noises, then you can use the Kalman filter. Otherwise, you need to resort to approximations. And in this setup, usually you resort to Monte Carlo methods. And most of the cases, I would say, um, you can do things in, with MCMC, but uh, most of the cases, I would say that you do particle filtering, also called sequential Monte Carlo, which is an important sampling algorithm. Um, so the filtering distribution, which is this one here, P of X T, given all these observations, is going to be um, uh, approximated with a set of weighted samples, exactly the same as we have seen before. You have the weight and you have the samples. This is a clear uh, trademark of important sampling, okay? One could uh, wonder about how to select adapt the number of particles. I think this is quite in, an interesting and open problem. I don't have time to, to, to discuss about this, so I'm going to, to skip this part. Let me go to the booster particle filter. Particle filter is a generic methodology as important sampling. You can, you can see it more or less in the sense that there are many algorithms, different algorithms that are called particle filters. And the, maybe the most important one, the, the original one, and maybe the most used one is the booster particle filter, which is called sequential important resampling. I would like to derive it in the usual way that is derived. I don't have time to do this, so I will present, this, uh, present it as a recipe, okay? And then uh, in, in an algorithm, algorithm, algorithmic manner, and then we will, we will discuss it a bit more. You initialize, the particles. You're going to have at each time a step, the filtering distribution approximated with M, capital M particles, okay? You initialize it using the prior of the state. This is the model, you know it. And then you will use, remember the blue uh, equation, the transition model of the state. You're going to simulate, uh, propagate, predict, as you want to call this, the new set of samples by using this model. So for each particle, you, uh, you uh, plug it uh, here, condition to the previous uh, value of the, of the particle, and then you simulate, okay? The second step is the update. This particle here is going to receive a weight that is proportional to the likelihood evaluated at the value of the sample. Each sample will be evaluated in the likelihood, and this is its importance weight, okay? You could uh, stop here for uh, time step t, but usually you need to do a resampling step. I don't have time to go into details, but maybe you heard about the um, um, particle degeneracy. And uh, for practical uh, purposes, you need to do this resampling step usually some now and then, and, but in the booster particle filter case, you do it uh, at every time step. And basically you do a resampling, it's very similar to what I explained in the uh, Population Monte Carlo uh, context. You have this set of, particles, associated weights, and then you will pick from these particles with probability equal to these weights, because these weights are normalized, they sum up to one. And uh, then you will 
end up with a, a new set of, again, M particles, original set M particles, this resulting set M particles, uh, with equal weights, equally weighted uh, particles, okay? If you do this, um, <clears throat> then in the next time step, uh, remember that you will, um, you will uh, condition here in order to simulate the new set, but actually you will condition on this uh, set of resampled particles, okay? This is the bootstrap particle filter. Just one small uh, remark that will be useful later. <clears throat> Doing the resampling step is equivalent to sampling from this mixture. I repeat, if you do the multinomial resampling from a set of particles, weighted particles, where the weights are normalized, this is equivalent to simulating these guys here from this mixture um, that is the, 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 the approximation, the, the weighted uh, approximation with the Dirac, with the point masses at each sample here, okay? This is equivalent, okay. This is a pictorial representation that is usually useful to, to uh, figure out or, or imagine if you do not work with uh, particle filters. You are coming from here, you have, those are the particles from the previous time step. Remember that you are coming from a resampling step. Some particles might be replicated. Here we have, for example, five replicas. Then you propagate, you condition here, and then you simulate uh, five particles from this one, and then from this one, one, and so on, and then you obtain this set of particles. Remember that these particles require an importance weight, and this weight is going to be the likelihood. So this represents the likelihood uh, function. We are working in, in one dimensional space. So basically what I'm doing here is that I'm evaluating the likelihood at the values of each sample. Once you do this, then you will um, obtain the importance weight. What I'm representing here is that the area more or less intuitively is bigger when the importance weight is bigger. So this is, for example, a, a, a big important, importance weight. So this is big circle. And then you will do the resampling and uh, the big the particles with big or the large or large weight will be more prone to be replicated. For example, this is going to be replicated four times. This is smaller, maybe once, and the very small probably they will be killed. They will be not replicated. Okay, this is the booster particle filter explained in a graphical manner. The auxiliary particle filter. I apologize in advance for this uh, for this slide. I will do my best in order to explain it the best I can. The auxiliary particle filter is an alternative to bootstrap particle filter. Uh, it, it is supposed to work better than the bootstrap particle filter, but it's not always the case. And actually, in many scenarios, it works uh, worse. Um, the initialization is exactly the same as in the bootstrap particle filter, the M samples from the prior. But then in the recursive step, there are more, more, um, <clears throat> more things to do. First, for each um, transition kernel, so this is the model, remember, but we need to particularize at the previous particle. So for each previous particle, I need to compute the mean of the kernel. This, this is transition kernel, actually uh, placed somewhere, and I compute the mean, okay? Then once I have this mean, I hope at least that the colors help to, to follow, then I compute these normalized weights lambdas. Okay, these lambdas are going to be the importance weights from the previous time step times this likelihood evaluation. I'm using already the observation, the observation evaluated at the mean of, of each kernel, okay? I obtain these lambdas and now I do a resampling step using these lambdas and I will pick from this set of samples from previous time step using these lambdas. Just one detail, imagine that you remove this part here, it's not the case in auxiliary, but if you remove it, it would be exactly as the bootstrap particle filter, okay? Because you would do the resampling from this set of particles using these important weights. But here we are modifying the weights that are used in order to do the resampling, okay? Once you have done the, the, this resampling, an important thing is that whenever you uh, resample a particle, you remember, you want to remember the index of the ancestor. You want to know what is the parent of the new particle, okay? So basically you will remember that this new M particle is going to come from the particle T, uh, T minus one, which is indexed by IM for the M particle, okay? You remember the index. Why do you need to remember? that the, the, This prediction or this propagation, now it's the same as in the booster particle filter, you simply propagate using the state. But you need to remember this index 
because you will use it now in the importance weight. So actually, the importance weight, the weights that you will use in order to approximate the filtering distribution with your new samples, importance weights, will be the likelihood evaluated at the sample. But now you need to somehow discount in the denominator the value of the likelihood of the center of the kernel that you used in order to simulate the sample at time t, the mth sample. So I hope it was more or less clear. I said that I apologize because for me, this is quite difficult to figure out how this is an important sampling algorithm. And maybe you were wondering the same for the booster particle filter. Maybe uh, many of you know the, the, the standard derivation in the booster particle filter of the uh, weight of the trajectory and so on. Uh, but if not, it's not straightforward in the booster particle filter. For me here, it's almost impossible to see how this is an important sampling uh, algorithm, just because I'm telling you that at the end, I will have samples or, or particles with associated weights, okay? So because of this difficulty, uh, we thought, okay, let's try to, to see the auxiliary particle filter, but also other filters in a different perspective. And this is what this paper is about. And it's seeing particle filtering from a multiple important sampling perspective. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to again focus on iteration t. We are targeting the filtering distribution at iteration t. Again, this is initialized and iteration zero from the prior, exactly the same initialization. And then at each time step, I will do the following. And hopefully this now at least is more consistent with what we saw in part one and part two. If this is an important sampling algorithm, I want to have a clear proposal. And I'm going to use this proposal. This proposal is going to be a mixture of M components using these transition kernels. Why I'm using this? Well, spoiler alert, you could use any other proposal. You could use anything you want. I'm using this structure of proposal. Still, we have the degrees of freedom of the lambdas. We'll see later. But I'm using this mixture, using these kernels, because bootstrap particle filter, auxiliary particle filter, and other filters use this structure, okay? And I will try to recover these filters from this other new perspective, I would say. Um, so this, uh, this is the structure of the proposal. The first thing I need to do is to select these lambdas in order to have my actual proposal. I know what C is, and then I know how to do the sampling. Before we talk about prediction or propagation, let's call it sampling. I'm going to simulate my N sample, capital M samples from the uh, proposal, okay? And then in important sampling, we know I do the sampling and then the weighting is target divided by proposal. We saw that, th that there might be uh, different possibilities. Let's stay um, into the simple version. I have this proposal and then I will use it in the denominator of the importance weight. And in the numerator, I have my targeted distribution. Remember how we started. I want to approximate the filtering distribution P of XT condition to all the observations up to time T. Okay. So this is going to be proportional to the likelihood times the predictive distribution. This is the distribution of XT condition to all uh, observations up to T minus one. Okay, this is basic uh, probability uh, manipulations. And then in the numerator, I still have the proposal. And here, um, unfortunately, this predictive distribution is one of these statistical problems, related problems that are very hard also to, to, to obtain. I cannot know this uh, analytically. But since I'm doing particle filtering, my particle filter allows me to approximate this guy here, this predictive distribution of the state. And actually it's nothing by this. I know the previous uh, weights of the T minus one. I know my previous particles, and this is going to be uh, the approximation of this predictive distribution. Okay, I plug it here. And from here to here, the only thing I'm doing is just substituting the C by the generic one, okay? So I leave it here. This is the generic framework. Two questions. First question, how do I select these lambdas? How do I select the weight of each component in such a way that I obtain a good algorithm? And second question, sorry, before, before that, uh, let me remind you, it's very important. In important sampling, we want that the proposal is as close as possible to the target, okay? We'll see it now very soon. The second question is, is it possible maybe to approximate this? Uh, because here I have a, a, a sum of M terms. Here I have also a sum of uh, capital M terms. Uh, this might be costly, especially if I use a large number of particles, okay? But this is a secondary question. I think the, the first one is more important. 
uh, this perspective we, we've been, uh, seen uh, lately, and it's, uh, it's necessary to note it, that this perspective is followed by this marginal particle filter, another particle filter derived in this, in this very nice paper. I, I fully recommend it. Um, okay, this is the generic uh, way to see um, particle filtering from multiple important sampling. You select the proposal, sample, and waiting. Let's try to recover the bootstrap particle filter. Initialization, as always. The recursive step for each T, I'm going to um, select the, the same mixture. This is my proposal. Remember, the only degree of freedom is which lambdas I'm going to plug here. And in my case, in the bootstrap particle filter case, I will plug the lambdas equal to the importance weights of the previous time step. I plug it here. Okay, then I do the sampling. This is always the same. Remember, the sampling from a mixture is equivalent to resampling and propagation from the previous perspective. So it's exactly the same to do a resampling step of these particles and then simulate from the transition kernel once you have resampled, then sample directly from here, okay? The weight, this is, uh, um, uh, sorry, up to here, up to this uh, equation here. This is exactly what I had in the previous slide. Likelihood try times the predictive approximated divided by my mixture. And now I particularize here in this step, my mixture with my choice of lambdas. And since this choice of lambdas is this WT minus one, I notice that this is exactly the same as the right hand side of the numerator. So I cancel out, I cancel out and then I obtain the likelihood evaluated at the nth uh, particle. One remark. Oh, two remarks, I would say. The first remark is this is exactly the same as the bootstrap particle filter, exactly the same. So we have recovered the particle filter from a totally different uh, perspective. Um, one remark, um, the bootstrap particle filtering is not matching the whole targeted distribution. Remember the numerator, it's matching part of it, the right hand, right hand side, but not this part. If you think about this, it makes sense because the bootstrap particle filter does the resampling and the propagation or the sampling before observing the observation that only plays a role in the likelihood when you obtain the weight. So clearly the, the, the proposal is not using the information of the new observation. That's why you're only matching this, okay? So what I was saying that resampling and propagation is exactly the same as sampling from a mixture and what we call before update is waiting. So now I feel, at least myself, I feel more comfortable saying I'm sampling from a mixture and then I'm using the standard importance weights and that's why I recovered the, the, the booster particle filter, okay? Let's see about the auxiliary particle filter. It's slightly more complicated, but at least we have the same structure, same framework. Particle filter seems uh, seen as proposal adaptation selection and then sampling and waiting. Okay, for the um, <clears throat> proposal uh, adaptation or selection, I remember my degree of freedoms are the, <clears throat> the lambdas. These lambdas, I, uh, this is the algorithm. Uh, I, I, I don't choose it. I want just to recover the auxiliary particle filter. What it does is to plug this, remember the previous uh, weights as the booster particle filter, but now multiply by this likelihood evaluated at the center of the kernel. Okay, why not? I plug it here and then I do the sampling. Remember, sampling from a mixture is first you select which component with probability proportional to lambda or equal if those are normalized. And once you have chosen the index, which kernel here you will use, then you uh, condition to this kernel, this is choosing the kernel, then you simulate. This is equivalent to simulating from the mixture. The, the important part here is that you are remembering which kernel you used for the simulation of XTM. Okay. And in the waiting, exactly the same uh, structure, target divided by proposal. Up to here is exactly the same I showed you in the previous slides, okay? Tricky part in this slide, going from here to here. Notice this. Notice that you have here a sum of all the kernels in the numerator and a sum of the M kernels also in the denominator with different weights, but same sum. Imagine for a second, and you need to, uh, to follow me on this, to believe me on this, that all the kernels are far apart. By far apart, I mean the following. Even if there are, those are Gaussians, imagine that they are 
located very far apart with respect to the, their variance. So ba basically, the overlap is very, very small, okay? What happens when you simulate from one kernel and then you evaluate this sample from one kernel in the whole mixture? What happens is that if this kernel is very far apart from other kernels, when you evaluate it, the only non-negligible evaluation in this mixture is going to be actually the one that you use in order to simulate this sample because the others are very far apart. When you evaluate in the other n minus one kernels, this will be zero. So from here to here, I'm just approximating and saying, do not worry about all the kernels evaluations, just worry about the kernel that you used in order to simulate this sample M. That's why I need to remember the index that I use here in order to simulate this sample here. If you believe me on this, um, that they, well, this assumption, you don't, you don't need to believe me, you, under this assumption, this whole, this is very accurate, then we recover this. From here to here, I'm just only substituting lambda equal to the likelihood at the center here and wt minus one, so I'm just substituting this lambda. And uh, voila, we can cancel this and this, this and this, and we, we recover exactly the same importance weight as in auxiliary particle filter. But now we have arrived from a totally different uh, path. <clears throat> One remark. The remark is that now, if you go back to, the, to, to here, now the proposal, remember, in the denominator is trying to match the numerator in such a way that for knowing which weight you will apply, sorry, which way you will apply to each kernel, you take into account the original weight, wt minus one, but you amplify each kernel by the factor that is the likelihood at the center of this kernel. So it's not that you are fully taking into account the whole numerator, but you're not using as in the bootstrap this mixture as, as proposal, you're going to amplify each kernel independently, separately by the value of its center, at the, uh, at the likelihood, okay? Hopefully, at least the intuition stays. So, same, same story. Um, we have this traditional way of seeing a, a very particle filter. I will not repeat, but now we can see this and we have a, a, a mapping from the previous perspective to this perspective that is simply a multiple importance sampling. I think it's a, it's a, a way, maybe a, a way more clear to, to, to see it. Summary of this, and we are almost ar arriving to the, to the end. Sorry for, uh, for taking a bit more time. So the summary, very, very briefly. We want to have a framework that sees particle filter as a multiple important sampling perspective. For the moment, we particularize to this selection of proposals. I insist you could choose different proposals, but we want this proposal where your degree of freedom is the lambdas. Then you do the sampling. When you have the lambdas, you know exactly, perfectly how to do this sampling. And then the weights is target divided by proposal evaluated at the sample, as evaluated at the particle. Depending how you obtain this, sorry, how you select these lambdas, and if you do some approximations here or not, you can recover at least these three particle filters, the bootstrap particle filter, auxiliary particle filter, and the improved auxiliary particle filter. This is something that we proposed once we uh, saw this these different perspectives that is uh, uh, very, I will tell you very honestly, it's most, more costly than the auxiliary particle filter because you have all these sums, but uh, we will see later that, uh, that uh, it's uh, somehow interesting at least uh, as, um, as an exercise. So I insist you, you pick this lambda, then you select which weight. When I say select, it's not that you can put what you, you, what you can, you need to follow this uh, target by, by proposal, then you can do maybe some approximation if you wish, but at least be conscious of which approximation or assumption you are doing. Last example, you have this example for, um, you have this uh, uh, likelihood, this is the likelihood, uh, this is for one uh, um, particular T, okay, and then the likelihood is here. The predictive distribution is this guy here, dotted black, why? Because these um, solid lines are the four kernels already weighted with the wt minus one. So if you do the sum of these weighted kernels, remember that was the right hand side of the numerator. That is actually equal, equivalent to the proposal that you use in the bootstrap particle filter. This is the proposal in bootstrap. Remember, this uh, weighted uh, 
uh, using the weights of uh, WT minus one of these uh, transition kernels. Um, the targeted distribution, the filtering distribution is proportionally to the likelihood times the predictive. So the green times the black one, the, the dashed lines. This is the bootstrap proposal. Visually, we can see not very good fit. Alternative particle filter is going to remember, it's going to take the same kernels with the same WT minus one, but then it's going to amplify by the value of the likelihood at the center of this kernel. And this is exactly what I'm representing here in circles. So this kernel here will be amplified by this factor. This other kernel in red will be amplified by this kernel with this factor. And these two kernels are going to be actually attenuated because the likelihood at, at their, their centers is almost zero. So this is the auxiliary particle filter proposal. In the improved one, you get even closer proposal, okay? Uh, no surprise, in some examples, it works better the improved auxiliary particle filter at, at the expense, as I said, of, of increasing the, the, the complexity. I will not uh, enter into details here, and I will go directly to the conclusion uh, very, very fast. In the part one and, and two, and there's a typo there, uh, we've seen that uh, there is an increased interest in multiple important sampling and uh, adaptive important sampling. Uh, many, many works, uh, mm, new works in important sampling are appearing, uh, I would say, more and more. Um, I try to do a, not a review in this slide. Uh, I apologize for the very relevant uh, references that might be missed there or in adaptive important sampling. It's, uh, it becomes very difficult to track uh, everything. Um, there are more efficient and, and high performance and multiple important sampling estimators. I think we are going higher in, in dimension uh, related to the, the previous uh, questions. And there are also better adaptive mechanisms maybe combined with uh, some optimization and machine learning techniques. And, and uh, th there are a lot of investigation in, this, in these lines. In the third part, um, we've seen that, uh, that auxiliary particle filter has been uh, used in, for a long time. Sometimes it's not clear why it doesn't work better. And we believe that this perspective from multiple important sampling and after important sampling uh, helps to put uh, everything in, uh, in this uh, more adapt sampling waiting steps instead of more, I would say, more engineering uh, prediction update uh, resampling uh, steps. And I think it, it clarifies several things because it clarifies the assumptions you are making, as I said, and the approximations you are taking. So in my opinion, it's useful to develop better uh, particle filters, but it's also useful to realize if in the model that you are using or in your application, some assumptions are, uh, are holding or not. In that case, I think it also use, is useful to understand existing methods and maybe it helps the practitioners to, to, to choose which uh, particle filter they, they should use. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, yes, if someone else has some questions for before ending the session, we will answer now. So, well, in the meanwhile, so thank you all for coming. Um, the next talk in the in the seminar will be on the uh, so next week some of us have uh, ICML so we just we just post the, the, the series not to not to overlap with with the conferences so the 20 the, on July 29th we have the next talk by uh, Chen Zhang uh, from Microsoft Research in Cambridge and uh, she will talk about efficient element wise information acquisition with Bayesian experiment design so you can already register in, in the website. So no more questions. So no more questions then. So thank you, Victor, very much. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And uh, see you all next time. Oh, no, wait, wait. Yes, one, one yeah, Antonita Mira says, uh, can you share the website? Yeah, oh, yeah, the website, yeah, OK. I will share it here before going. Uh, so give me. 10 seconds and, and in the website you can you can subscribe to the okay I will show it Antonita through the uh, in the chat um, let me do it okay done
So in the website, you can register to the mailing list so that you keep um, updated with the new seminars. And uh, so we have all the sessions. The session is, has been recorded, so we will share it in the, in the website. And uh, some people also, Victor, asked for the slides. So if you want to share them, uh, Absolutely. We, can already, we can already upload it to, to the website. Yeah, 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 we'll send it uh, to Perfect. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Bye.